Hi everybody, welcome to part one of your DNA RNA protein synthesis notes. So in this first video, we're going to first talk about some DNA discovery in terms of who helped discover the structure of DNA, as well as what DNA really is and how it replicates. So first, when we're talking about the discovery of DNA, there are several really important people that you need to be aware of. And the people you see listed below are in order of their discovery, of how their discovery led to the ultimate model of DNA. So we'll start with Griffith. So Griffith did a, a bunch of different studies, but he essentially discovered that genetic information is passed down between organisms. So offspring get their genetic information from their parents. Avery then concluded that DNA carries that genetic code. So we started with just there's some sort of genetic code. Now we know that DNA has that code. Hershey and Chase took it a step further, seeing that genes were made of DNA. So DNA is what makes those genes, which are what you inherit from your parents. Chargaff is really important in that he understood, he understood base pairing and how the bases pair and how it's an equal amount. So A and T, which we'll learn what those stand for in just a moment, and then G and C. So A and T pair together, and because they pair, if there's 40% A, there has to be 40% T. Same with G and C. G and C also always occur in equal amounts. Franklin was really important because she actually was known for a really well-known x-ray image that actually showed the structure of DNA. Unfortunately, Watson and Crick are credited with the structure of DNA, although there's some controversy because they found out about her, her image and then they used her image to help them finally make that final model of DNA, which is that twisted base that you see. So when we talk about the DNA of structure, the structure of DNA, first of all, we need to know what DNA stands for, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. There's a sugar in DNA called deoxyribose and then nucleic acid. So a nucleotide, if you think back to our previous units, a nucleotide is the building block or the monomer of DNA. Well, a nucleotide is made of three things. So we have that sugar, deoxyribose, you have a phosphate group, and then you have a base. And by base, I'm referring to A, T, G, or C, specifically A for adenine, T for thymine, G for guanine, and C for cytosine. So the DNA structure itself is like a ladder, kind of like a twisted ladder, as you see. So there's rails on the side, and those rails alternate sugar and phosphate. And then the rungs, or the steps of the ladder, are those base pairs coming together. All right, so we've talked about the base pairings, but now let's talk about what they are in a little more detail. So bases are either a purine or a pyrimidine. And you can see the difference in structure here. So this one has two rings. And this one only has one ring, okay? And a really easy way to remember which one belongs to which is pyrimidine has a Y, and cytosine has a Y, and thymine has a Y. So if you want to remember which bases are pyrimidines, it's the ones that have Y, so cytosine and thymine, making adenine and guanine your purines. And they always pair purine to pyrimidine. All right, so another term that's going to come up a lot in this unit is central dogma. And central dogma is essentially how DNA eventually turns into a protein. So this first video here is going to focus on just this part of it, okay? And then we're going to have another set of video notes that focus on all the rest. So how DNA is eventually made into an RNA molecule and then protein. All right, when we talk about DNA replication, this is where it starts to get a little tricky. So prokaryotes and eukaryotes have very different models of doing DNA replication. You hopefully remember that prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, they just have that DNA in the center. Well, that DNA is kind of all twisted together, but it's just one single fork where it's gonna start and then it goes all the way around until it reaches each other. That's how replication occurs. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, have lots more DNA. It's in a nucleus, it's a much more complex cell, so their replication forks are all throughout it. So there's going to be hundreds of places where replication starts and then continues in both directions from every single fork until they all meet up again. 
Another thing you need to be aware of is the model of DNA replication that we follow. So we follow what's known as the semi-conservative model. And that just means that you see your parent DNA here. Each strand of that parent DNA, so it's two strands, helps and splits apart to make new DNA. So the parent strand splits and then they make a copy of each other. And then you get two DNA with half parent and half new. Then that will replicate again, causing even more genetic variety as it replicates there. So where and when? Hopefully you remember DNA is found in the nucleus, unless you're a prokaryote, and then it's in something called a nucleoid. And it happens during the S phase of interface. So there's four major steps of DNA replication you need to be aware of. So we start with initiation, which is kind of easy, right? You initiate something, you start something. Then we do unwinding. So the DNA has to unwind before it can replicate. Then we do elongation or growing that DNA chain, followed by termination or ending. When we talk about initiation, there's something called an initiator protein that has to bind to that origin. So remember, if we're a eukaryote, there are multiple origins all throughout the DNA. Prokaryotes just have one, but it's going to bind to that origin of replication. Then we quickly go to the unwinding stage. So single-stranded binding proteins are actually going to hold the DNA open, and then DNA helicase Another enzyme is going to break those hydrogen bonds, so it's going to kind of travel up the DNA and split it apart into the two different strands of DNA. That way replication can occur. When we split the DNA, we're left with two very different strands. So we have what's called a leading strand and a lagging strand. So five prime to three prime or three prime to five prime, that's just what they use to talk about DNA and how the different ends are. You just need to remember which way goes which. Now they always go opposite. So if you have five prime, three prime, the replicated one is going to be five prime pairing with three and three prime pairing with five, as you see in this picture here. Think of it like magnets, right? If you're trying to get magnets to stick together, you're going to do opposites, not use the same because then they repel each other. So anyway, our lagging strand is going to run five prime to three prime as a template. So if you look down here, this is our lagging strand. Well, because of that, it has to replicate 5 prime to 3 prime. DNA always replicates 5 prime, 5 prime to 3 prime, but it re only replicates in fragments because as the DNA unwinds, it's going to continue unzipping. So you're going to start here and move this way, but oh, now more's unwound. So let's say this part's up here. You have to start there, go that way. So you end up with all these fragments. And it's a super fun word to say, okazaki. Okay. Our leading strand, on the other hand, is leading because it's not a fragment. It is continuous replication. So our leading strand is over here. It's this one. And you see our continuous replication. It's able to just keep moving while the DNA keeps unzipping. A really easy way, too, to think about this is, like, if you and your friend are running a race, your friend keeps stopping to tie his shoe, okay, you're going to win the race because you're not stopping. So you would be the leader and your friend would be the lagger. So leading strand is that continuous, it doesn't stop, lagging stops and makes different chunks of DNA. All right, so in the elongation stage, like I've already said, replication always moves from five prime to three prime. This is super important, so please highlight this in your notes. There's also some other important enzymes that are at play here. So first of all, we have primase. Primase has to add a short segment of RNA to build those Okazaki fragments. So which strand do you think primase is used on? Leading or lagging? If you answered lagging, that would be the correct answer. So primase has to add those short little segments of RNA to build those Okazaki fragments. DNA polymerase works on both the leading and the lagging strand, and there's a bunch of them on this diagram. There are all these little blue guys here. Those just add those nucleotides. And if we remember, a nucleotide is a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. So it's essentially building the other half of the strand of DNA. And then, of course, all good things must come to an end, right? So once we're finished replicating, we terminate or we finish. So it stops when one of two things can happen. One, two replication forks meet, so they meet, they're done, there's nowhere else to go. 
or you get something called a termination sequence, which we will go into in much more detail, but it's essentially like a stop codon. So once you get a termination sequence, you're done, no more replication. But we do still have a little problem, right? What about all those fragments? You can't have fragments of DNA. You have to have them as one continuous strand. So another enzyme for you to know, DNA ligase, is going to go through and link those fragments together to create one continuous strand. Well, mistakes, right? Everyone makes mistakes. I'm sure DNA makes mistakes is what you're probably thinking, but it's actually pretty good at not making mistakes. So the error rate of DNA replication is actually just one mistake per billion nucleotides it adds. And even if an error is made, it's caught and fixed in many different ways. So first, we have our nucleotide selection. In general, DNA is very, very good at selecting the proper nucleotide. If that fails, though, we have something called proofreading. So the DNA polymerase, as it's adding, it's going to stop, go back, remove the wrong one, and then add the right one and continue on. If that still doesn't happen, there's another fun enzyme that's going to go back and look for mismatched bases and then replace it with the correct one. All right, the last thing in your notes we're going to do is just a little practice. So if we go back and we remember A pairs with T, and G pairs with C, let's do these replication practices. So C pairs with G, C pairs with G, G pairs with C, T, A, T, A, A pairs with T, T pairs with A, G pairs with C. All right, I want you to go ahead and pause the video here, and I want you to complete the replication for the other two remaining, and then I'll do them and you can check your work. So pause it here. All right, so hopefully now you've done the replication practice, so let's check your work. So you should have A, T, C, C, G, A, T, T, and for this bottom one here, T, C, G, 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 A, T, C. And that is all for your first set of notes.